Android ecosystem fragmentation. Oh, this ever-present problem. Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on The Nexus. I'm your host, Ian R. Buck, and today we're going to talk about Android 11. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO106. So, yes, this episode is very, very late. Android 11 first launched last August or early September. Um, I have a Pixel 3 device, so, of course, I have had it and have been using it uh, for that entire time. Um, But... As it turns out, distance learning uh, was a heck of a lot more work this last fall semester than uh, than I could have ever expected. Um, so I had to put uh, podcast projects on hiatus for a little while. Um, and yeah, if you want to hear more about um, how distance learning has been going, uh, I'll be making an episode about that over on The Extra Dimension uh, sometime in the near future. So go and subscribe to that show and keep an eye out for for that episode sometime in the next week or so. But we're here to talk about the new version of Android. So um, I guess one of the advantages of uh, waiting this long to come out with a review of Android is that uh, most phone manufacturers have actually been rolling it out to uh, their devices. So even like if you're on a Samsung phone, for example, uh, I believe that most of Samsung's um, current currently uh, supported phones have gotten the Android 11 update fairly recently. Um <laughs> and uh, I we we are I'm I'm releasing this episode a little bit before they're actually starting to put out like you know Android 12 developer previews or anything like that. So this is still this is the current version of Android that's uh, that's currently out there. Unfortunately, Google has stopped giving each of their new versions of Android a you know a cute. Um, dessert-based name. So this is literally just called Android 11. Uh, I believe this would have been Q, maybe? Or was that last year? Anyway, uh, let's talk about some of those new features that we've got. First up, notifications. So this definitely, it wouldn't be an Android update if they hadn't changed how notifications work. Um, The big main thing uh, that that you'll notice that's different in your notifications is that um, different conversations are now threaded in um, in the notifications so they're, they're not just grouped per app but within each app uh, the, the the different conversations have different, groupings of notifications in your like system notification tray right now this feature does depend on the app developer actually like targeting the newest version of that api so not all apps um will will be doing this um and of course this only like applies to chat applications and there are a lot of communications applications that don't consider themselves to be like a an instant messaging right a a chat app um so in some cases like you won't see this feature because the developers just haven't gotten around to implementing yet uh and other times you might see it just you won't see that feature because like the developers don't think that it's what they want their app to do um so for example like slack and gmail uh those are both apps that like you know have been like the developers are still keeping those apps up to date but they don't target this like the these chat features um Slack, I think, because they, you know, are encouraging people to, like, create threads based on each new message instead of, like, treating an entire channel as one chat thread. Um, And Gmail, I guess, because, like, I'm the only person in the world who wants to treat my email inbox as, like, an instant messaging platform, I guess. (laughs) But I really want that to be a thing. Um, So I guess I I could go and seek out a an email client that actually uh would do that kind of thing um so if if an app uh has been 
created to target these these chat features uh they will appear above all other notifications they get priority um and also chat bubbles are like an officially supported feature now um so just about any of these uh these chat applications will like like android will let you create or take those threads and turn them into like bubbles so that they can float on top of other apps that you're using um we we've seen that kind of thing, you know, for quite a few years now. Um, that you know, the the Facebook Messenger app, for example, had had chat heads. I think is what they called it. Um, we had things like Link Bubble, right? Um, that that just kind of took advantage of accessibility features to like f- like fake this this feature. Um, but uh, I, I I personally decided like many years ago that I didn't like having those bubbles, um, and so I like turned this feature off immediately when I got when I up, upgraded to Android 11. Um, one of my favorite things about these new like threading uh, um, features is that you can set a notification importance on a per thread basis, not just on a per app basis. So like in the past, I would have to decide whether I wanted like all of my messages that were coming in through Facebook Messenger, right? Do I think that those are more or less important than the messages that I'm getting through like um, Google messages, right? So my SMSs. Um, And I I would set like the, the, whether that app was going to be able to make noise, whether it was gonna vibrate, whether it was going to like pop over the screen, right? Um, Now all of those settings, you can do them per thread so i can choose individual people who are sending me text messages and i decide whether or not i care about them which it like it makes so much sense it's like duh of course i want to set these um according to who is sending them to me not according to what avenue they're sending it through um unfortunately there are some apps that like override these system settings so I'm looking at you, Facebook Messenger, where like I, I will go and s- tell Android, okay, I don't want to hear a notification every single time that like this particular group chat sends a message because like maybe it's a very large group chat and there's always people talking in there. Um, but then like Facebook Messenger kind of overrides that and starts making noise anyway, which is like untenable. Um, we shouldn't allow app developers to get away with that kind of thing uh and honestly it kind of it it almost makes me want to just like uninstall the facebook messenger app um and uh (laughs) and only check my my facebook messages like when i go and do my once a day check in on facebook on my desktop computer but you know (sighs) you can't win everything Last thing about notifications, and this is a really nice one. Um, notification history is now a thing. You do have to go and turn it on in the system settings, though. Um, it's not on by default. Um, but like this has saved my butt several times already. Um, just like you know, because sometimes you accidentally swipe away a notification, or like um, maybe it's super cold out and your phone, like you know, the the battery um, isn't able to power the phone and it shuts down. Down. and then you turn it back on and you're like oh crap there were like three or four notifications that were waiting for me and i don't know what they were um you can just you know tap on notification history and look at a list of all of the notifications that you had perfect related to notifications is the media playback controls so in previous versions of android of course when you started playing music or podcasts or whatever um the app that you were using would like put a media controls notification up there in your notification tray and you would see that little icon you know like even when you don't have when you haven't pulled down any notifications right you would see a little icon representing that app uh up there in the the notification bar um but that's that icon no longer appears um the media playback controls are like displayed above all of the other notifications but it's not actually in the notification section anymore so it's kind of it's pinned it's like a part of the quick settings um and it's pinned like right below 
all of the the, the whole grid of like quick settings um, icons there. The media playback controls do appear on the lock screen. Um, however, the like the lock screen doesn't show a a like blurred version of the album art anymore which i think is a big shame i really liked having that album art like showing up on the lock screen it was kind of it was a nice touch um but that's not there anymore and i think that the reason for that is because these playback widgets are no longer like you don't like swipe them away um when you're done listening to stuff you just kind of you know you hit pause and then you like um you know you swipe up from the notification tray to go back to doing whatever it is that you were doing before and those like all the the media playback controls for like all of the apps that you have used uh in the recent past those all stay up there in that little section that's that's uh pinned to the quick settings um and it's paginated so you can like you know scroll through all of these these different you know so like i would have youtube music and pocket casts and like google play books because you know I, I listen to audiobooks every once in a while um stuff like that right all, all of those different media players like um if i have played something on in an app like it will appear up there now some of the apps will like their media controls will stay up there even after you have like restarted the phone and everything um and i think that those those media players are targeting you know the the most current version of whatever api it is for for media playback um so if you are using a, a media player that does not target that that newest version of the api um then like when that if that app gets cleared from memory then the media playback controls will disappear from that list up at the top um and oddly enough like that is the case for youtube music which is very strange because that is now the like first party you know google's preferred media player um but that <laughs> that that one like goes away from those media controls areas when i'm when i haven't listened to music in a while um but like pocket casts and uh google play books right those both stay up there for forever and ever uh overall i, I like this change of you know like keeping those media controls up there forever because it has allowed me to um remove the playback widgets that i used to have on my home screen so i've been able to downsize um the the stuff that i have on my home screen and you know use like use that space for for other things um which is which is great another really nice uh touch for for those media playback controls is that like in the little in the upper right hand corner of the media controls it has a button that lets you choose what audio audio output you want to be using um so like you might have like if you have your bluetooth uh headphones still on and connected to your um to your phone you don't necessarily have to be playing your music through those headphones you can manually you can change it to like come out of the phone speakers directly uh at any time and you don't have to like go and turn off or disconnect your your headphones um i think that's that's a really like neat feature nice quality of life thing um i it doesn't come up very often uh, in my experience, but like, um, I really appreciate it when it, when I do use it. Speaking of the quick settings, um, the, there are only six icons per page up there in the quick settings. Now I think it was nine before. Um, and that's because the, these media playback controls like take up the space that, that, that bottom row would have taken up. So app permissions so these of course you know are when, when you install an app and uh, you open it for the first time and it's asking you for permission to like access your camera and your location and like all the files on your phone and whatever whatever um most of these app permissions will now have a new option it used to just be kind of like allow this all the time or deny this or whatever um uh, or like only when this app is open um you can now choose to allow that permission, but 
only this time. Um, so once you, I guess once you like close the app, um, then that permission gets revoked, um, which like, dang, that's, that's a powerful, that's a powerful option to have. I love it. Um, also location access in the background. Um, so the, the, the options that you will see when an app asks for this permission are just like, um, only while this app is open or deny it. Um, and if, if an app wants to be able to, uh, query your location even when the app is in the background uh it's going to have to send you into the system settings and then you'll be able to turn on like location access all the time in the system settings um so i guess that that's just kind of like by adding that one extra step um i think google is kind of trying to like protect the users from themselves right from making um decisions that they might regret Android also will now kind of like default to revoking app permissions if you haven't opened an app for a while. Overall, I think that's a good thing um, because, you know, like I definitely have a few apps on my phone that like I installed them a long time ago and I haven't really thought about them in a long time and I don't really use them. So they don't really need permission to like access um, my location and whatever. But also like some of some of the apps that i that i have are like utility apps that i'm never really going to go and open them but i have them like running in the background on my phone all the time and they do have certain permissions that they need in order to like operate correctly so uh i can definitely i i can imagine cases where uh android might be like revoking permissions for things that i that I do want them to have, and um, I'm not sure that I that that Android has a good way of like telling me um, if if an app is like not working as expected anymore because some some permission has been revoked. Um, I haven't noticed anything catastrophic happening though, and since I've had this operating system for like six months, I think we're probably pretty safe. I think it's probably I, I'd say it's a good that's a good feature. New power button menu. So when you hold down the power button on your phone, um, we used to have just kind of like these these uh, options that would uh, pop up on the side of the screen. Um, now this power button menu fills up the entire screen, and it's got quite a few different things that that are included there. Um, so you've got an emergency button, which um, will contact you know emergency services. Um, Lockdown, uh, which uh, will like immediately locks your phone and also disables any um, biometric authentication, right? So you won't be able to like use your fingerprint or any facial recognition or anything like that to unlock the phone. Uh, you have to put in your like pattern or your pin or whatever you set um, for unlocking your phone. So if you if you know that you are going into a situation where like somebody might uh you might be in a position where somebody might like force you to put your finger onto your fingerprint sensor in order to unlock your phone right you can't be compelled to do that um it, the the phone will only unlock uh from your from your pin now i'm pretty sure like on the on, if we talk about the back end right um where it doesn't take the phone all the way into the like fully encrypted like your phone has not been unlocked since you like restarted state. I think that most of the the apps and files and things have been like they remain unencrypted in 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 the way that they are normally when your phone is like on and the screen is off. Um, but uh, it's it's better it's better I think than not having this feature um if you're really really paranoid about like somebody trying to actually like gain physical access to your phone and um you know and and get at your encrypted files like you're best off just to like hold down the power button until it just shuts off um so yeah which by the way of course power that is one of the things that is in the power button menu um you can you can turn off the phone from there um, they also have a, uh, 
like uh, choosing which which credit card you want to use for tap to pay. Um, so if you have like multiple different credit cards, um, you can cycle through those before you like hold the phone up to a a, a, a tap to pay you know credit card reader kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, they have um, smart home controls, um, which is like I mean I haven't really used this much because like I use I. If I, if I really need to go in and fiddle with, with the settings for, like, the smart home things at my house, I go into the Google Home app because they're all within, like, the Google Home ecosystem. Um, but I guess Google thought that, the, that, that this kind of thing was important enough to, like, have this whole scrolling page of, of uh, smart home stuff. Now, one thing was removed uh, from the power button menu, and that is the uh, screenshot button. Um, we'll, we'll talk uh, more about screenshots uh, later on in the episode. Emoji. So uh, when Android 11 first launched, Emoji 13 was the latest and greatest uh, emoji set. Um, since then, uh, Emoji 13.1 has come out, and, uh, and Android um, also supports that. Um, Android, like, Google seems to be the only major uh, distributor, um, the only major platform as of February 12th, 2021, uh, that actually supports emoji 13.1 right now, which is, which is wild. Um, because I do have some, some new favorite emoji, uh, in this new emoji set. Um, so like the face in clouds emoji. Oh, I love that one. Um, I, I use it, like I, I send it to people when I'm like kind of sarcastically being sneaky. Um, and it's a great, it's a great looking emoji, but like, um, the only the other people who are on like pixel phones uh, get to see this emoji in its in its full glory. Um, but there are a few others uh, from from emoji 13.0 that uh, that most other people will will get to see. So um, pinched fingers, love that one. Uh, we've got the disguise one where you know a guy is like wearing this big old like Groucho Marx uh, nose with a mustache. We got a ninja one. Um, we've got new gender options for a few different things, such as like the wedding dress, uh, emoji. Yeah. Um, the gravestone, there's a lot of potential there. And, uh, besides, besides the new characters that are supported, um, Google also kind of redesigned their emoji set yet again. It's, it's, this one's kind of a subtle, a more subtle redesign than the last redesign that they did. Um, but, uh, for, for this, for this design, they don't have these the the big like um bold borders around the the faces and around the objects um they still have color gradients but the color gradients that they had before kind of faded from like it was like dark on the top and then it would fade to a lighter shade of that color at the bottom um now they have like the darker color around the outside edges of the faces and then it fades to the lighter color fades to the lighter shade uh at the center which has the effect of like making most of the faces feel much brighter um and i kind of i like that um it did it, it's a, it's it's a really subtle thing but it's like you know as soon as you look at it you're like wow wait things are really different here but like i can't quite put my finger on it um but that's that's kind of the the main source of the changes i think is is that the gradients go from like uh outside to in instead of top to bottom they also oddly enough like reverted a bunch of their animal emojis back to their old designs um so they had gone from like like in android 9 uh i believe it was they they um had like for most of the animals like the the animal's entire body was visible and then in android 10 they switched to um just showing like the the animal's face looking straight on at the camera very similar to like the human faces that we've got um and now in android 11 we're back to seeing like the animal's full bodies i don't know what's up with that it's somebody made a choice app switching and the overview menu uh so if you're using the the gesture navigation um 
UI, right? So instead of having like the, the three buttons or the two buttons down at the bottom, um, if you've just got that like, you know, the gesture bar um, where you swipe swipe from up from the bottom to like go home or like swipe left or right on that uh, bar at the bottom to switch between your like most recent apps, right? Um, those animations are so much better now. Um, in Android 10, they were pretty rough. They were jittery. Um, they like now they feel actually pretty natural. Um, and and like it moves at the speed that I would expect it to move based on how fast my finger is moving. Uh, I do occasionally though find cases where like I'll swipe to the right which should just send me to like you know the the most recent app that I had open and it will inexplicably just like send me to the 10th most recent app that I had open which is like wild it's it's I I don't understand why that happens um I haven't been able to identify uh, you know, a common set of circumstances that cause that to happen. So I don't know how to prevent it from happening. Um, and but it is it's like it's rare enough that it isn't something that I think about and like dread all the time. It's just like every once in a while it happens and it's like, oh, my God, really? Like now I got to I'm just going to go home and like open up that app manually. So Google engineers, if that's something that you can fix for Android 12, uh, I would love that. Now, uh, I mentioned that we were going to talk more about screenshots. Uh, this is the part where screenshots come up because um, there, there are now a couple of like new buttons in the overview list. So this is when you like uh, kind of swipe up halfway from, from that home bar um, and, it, and it shows you a uh, scrolling list of all of the most recent apps that you have had open. Um, below each of those uh, icons, or not icons, but like the little preview for that for that app, right? You now have two buttons. Uh, one of them is for taking a screenshot, and one of them is for selecting text. Um, so the screenshot button does exactly what you expect. It takes a screenshot of that app. Um, and uh, when you do that, you get this like little animation that you know looks like uh, a, a smaller version of like that that um, you know essentially it's like it's like grabbing that little preview image of the app and uh, it kind of zooms down to the lower left hand corner of your screen and then next to it you get uh, two buttons one is for just sharing the screenshot as is um, and then that opens up like you know the share menu so that you can uh, choose what app you wanna you wanna send it to. And you also have an edit button so that you can go and like annotate it and uh, highlight it and do whatever, crop it, you know, stuff like that. Um, you can also, of course, uh, as always, you can you can take a screenshot with a hardware button uh, shortcut uh, on my Pixel 3. That is the power button and the volume down button and, for a couple of seconds, and then it takes a screenshot. And uh, and that, that same animation, you know, that same little menu in the lower left-hand corner appears. Apparently, we were going to be getting um, scrolling screenshots, which uh, I know is a feature that uh, some other Android manufacturers like Samsung have uh, have been putting in their versions of Android. Um, I'm really jealous of that. I want scrolling screenshots, um, you know, because if you're if you're like using an app where there's like you know, the, the text or whatever you want to take a screenshot of is taller than the screen itself, um, the 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 phone can like scroll through all of that stuff and take you know several screenshots in a row that it then automatically stitches together. Um, that was a thing that uh, I believe the Google engineers were working on during the Android 11 um, like developer preview stuff, uh, but they were not able to get it finished for the final version of Android 11. Um, so crossing our fingers for for seeing that in Android 12. Um, but back to the talking about the overview list. So um, next to the screenshot button, you also have a select text button, which is pretty really like it's it's really nice. It will use uh, optical character recognition to take a look at the text that is in that app, and it will you know you can you can use your finger to like highlight which sections of text you want it to grab, and you can just copy that text. 
and this is this is really stinking great um especially from my perspective as somebody who like you know i i run the animorphs out of context twitter account um shameless plug go check it out there's some funny stuff in there um but i i read the animorphs books uh i get the the ebooks through the library right and the libby app which is what i use to uh read those books from the library of course i i don't own those books so it doesn't let me just like directly copy text from those books but i can just pull up you know the the overview menu select text from there uh you know and then and then copy it and uh, and then paste it into twitter and it's like oh yeah this is this this makes my life so much better um for for being able to just like highlight and copy small small snippets of text from from the apps that i'm using uh, I noticed that the the System Files app uh, seems to have been replaced, at least on Pixel devices. Um, it seems to have been replaced by the Files by Google app, which uh, I suspect that they did that because Google like really is trying to push adoption of that app. Um, because I know that like they're planning on using that as their like essentially their avenue um, for their like competitor to airdrop where you can just like send files to anybody else who's using a phone in the you know immediate vicinity no matter like what platform they're on and without you know either of you having to be like connected to the internet or anything like that um so i would definitely like to see a broader adoption of that so that so that you know i can actually send stuff to other people more easily more quickly um yeah, it is like Google trying to emulate an a- an Apple product that is already part of like the cultural consciousness. Of this though, so I kind of don't foresee it really succeeding. <laughs> Autofill suggestions in the keyboard. Oh man, this is a re- this is a very significant um, quality of life update. So. This particular API, the Autofill API, can draw from a lot of different sources. So it can like suggest um, stuff that you have in your clipboard, and usually it'll do that if you like recently, like if you just added something to your clipboard, right? It can draw stuff from Smart Reply, right? So like apps like Gmail. Um, or Google Messages, they have like these these smart reply suggestions, um, and and uh, and you know those can now appear in your keyboard um, name, address, credit card, that kind of stuff that you might have stored on your phone. Um, any password managers like this works with with third party password managers as well. I've seen uh, Bitwarden. Um, if if I have Bitwarden unlocked, right, um, then it can just like it'll immediately suggest um, items from whatever app or website I'm trying to log into. Um, those will all like, so, so these, these suggestions from the autofill um, API, these will appear in the like suggestions bar that's above your keyboard. So where you would typically just see like three different words that your keyboard thinks you might be trying to type, right? Um, so they appear in that in that space, um, but they are visually distinct from the ordinary like keyboard suggestions. Um, so these these autofill suggestions have like a rounded rectangle border around them. Oh, I love this feature! It's so good. Um, it it comes in handy like all the freaking time. Um, and honestly, like so. I've been using this version of, of Android for like six months now, and I took most of these notes way back in September, and I had kind of forgotten that this wasn't how things always were. So as I was reading this, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, like using using Bitwarden, for example, used to be like kind of a chore because like um, I would have to be using like the weird accessibility settings to like allow it to detect when I was like in a password field and stuff like that. And, you know, it wouldn't always do it. And so I'd sometimes have to go back into the app and like, oh, this autofill, this autofill API just like, like it makes the whole 
phone experience feel feel so much more cohesive like everything kind of ties together nicely uh in this in this this little api screen recorder um oh man i remember when i bought the nvidia shield tablet way back in like 2014 or whatever it was 13 maybe um and part of the reason that I bought that tablet was because it was pretty much like the first mobile device that you could uh, record the screen. Like, and and that was because uh, it was this this was Nvidia that we were talking about, and like Nvidia had invested a lot of like um, uh, research and development into their into their chipsets, into their hardware, to be able to like do a a hardware encoding of uh, these video files. Um, nowadays, I guess just whatever. Uh, the operating system will just do it, and our and our our um our mobile CPUs are just powerful enough to like handle it. Cool, uh, we've come a long ways. So, uh, yeah, this is built into Android now. You don't have to go and get like a really sketchy third party app uh, to do your screen recordings. Um, it lives uh, up there in the the quick settings uh, area. Um, you might have to go and like you know edit which items appear in your quick settings so that you can like add you know drag the screen recorder uh into there um when you tap on the button to start a screen recording it will um it'll give you a few different options like you can either um have it show touch events on the screen um i have found that to be very helpful especially so most of the screen recordings that i have been doing have been like if somebody asks me how to do a particular thing on the phone I'll just like record myself doing that thing and then send them that video. Um, so for that, for those purposes, like having it show touch events is very, very useful because I can just like tap on a spot and they know where I tapped. I don't have to describe where I'm tapping. Speaking of describing things, um, for the audio that's included in the screen recording, you can either choose to have it um, include audio from your microphone. Uh, you could have it... Uh, record the the audio that your phone is outputting right so anything that would be coming through the speakers or the or the headphones um, it can it can include that audio uh, or you could do both of those or you could do neither of those um, so you got all kinds of options there um, I have found that it is a pretty good video quality um, I haven't noticed like too many digital artifacts um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just like take a, a recording of uh, this the the screen stuff and I'll uh, put it in the in the show notes. I'll link to it in the show notes so you can go and check it out yourself uh, to see how it looks. Got a few more little like miscellaneous things, quick things uh, to talk about. So uh, dark mode um, can now be scheduled, so you can either like set the um, set the times that it will turn on or turn off um, or you can just tell it to like follow sunrise and sunset right um, very similar to like the the night shift where it uh, shifts everything you know to be a little bit more yellow and less blue um, you could also have your your phone switch from like light mode to dark mode based on the sunset for wi-fi networks um, when you like save a wi-fi network uh, to your phone um, you can tell you can tell android not to auto connect to that Wi-Fi network, um, which I think would, is, is very, very useful if you've got like a particular network that you want to be able to use when when you want to. Um, but like maybe maybe it's like your parents' Wi-Fi network and they have really slow internet at their house. Um, so by default, you kind of you don't want it to just like automatically start using that Wi-Fi network. But if you're like in a pinch and you and you need to connect to their Wi-Fi network, then you can do it manually. Uh, apps can now be pinned to the share sheet. Um, so this, I think this is probably one of the, the best improvements to the share sheet that they've had in many, many years. Um, cause the share sheet up until now has just kind of been this, like, uh, who knows what order things are going to come in there. And like, in, in theory, it should be like the apps that you use the most often that appear towards the top, but like, pfft. That's not always the case. Um, so now you can just manually choose like, okay, I quite often want to like send things to Twitter so that I can tweet them. Um, and, and you know, you can just like pin that uh, to the share sheet. By the way, also like um, if, if one app has like multiple different actions that it uh, puts in the share sheet, right? Those kind of get 
like grouped together and it's kind of like this little drop down menu below that um, that app's icon uh, and you can pin whichever one of those actions it is that you commonly use so like in the in the twitter example right you could either like tweet something or you could uh, dm it to somebody um, or you could like send it to fleets if you if that's a feature that you use um, but uh, you know so, so like for me personally i usually just tweet things I, I don't dm and i never use fleets um so like tweeting would be the one that i would pin to the share sheet hold for me oh gosh uh this okay i'm pretty sure that this is a an exclusive to pixel devices um and this is yeah one of like google's kind of headlining like using artificial intelligence to uh improve improve the lives of of their users um where your you can have your phone if you like call say ramsey county and they put you on hold because you know they don't have anybody to answer the phones um and you're gonna have to like wait there for two freaking hours to you know get a hold of somebody to talk about health insurance or whatever like uh you can now have your phone uh just like listen to the hold music for you so you don't have to hear all of this like crappy compressed uh smooth jazz or whatever it is and uh and then your phone when it when it hears an actual human pick up it will ring on your end and uh and and will um uh so so that you can you know you don't you don't miss that so if you remember, yeah, from like Google I.O. a few years ago when they started talking about like, oh, yeah, you can like tell your Google Assistant to um, call a restaurant and make a reservation. Do, do you guys remember restaurants? Man, restaurants. Um, yeah, you can like have it call and make an appointment for you and you don't even have to talk to the other person on the other line. Like this is kind of the next the next concept in that same family of, of features scheduling updates um oh man so one of the like big barriers that i have seen to like people being willing to keep their phones up to date is like oh yeah i saw that that notification that there's uh a system update ready but like i'm doing stuff with my phone right now and i can't i can't just like restart it because like i'm in the middle of doing something and then by the time you're done doing that thing like you're you're not using your phone and you're not thinking about it so you don't restart the phone um but they have added a little button to those um to those notifications to defer the update until after 2 a.m which is really great i love it um like i, I literally just pushed that button today it, it told me that there's an update ready and i was like okay do it while i'm sleeping um now of course this is this is best if you are somebody who has a sleep sc schedule that roughly follows the sun, right? Um my wife is often awake at 2 a.m. though. So like it would be nice if Android let you set like okay, what's up what would be a good time to to do an update, right? So maybe you choose like okay, always do it at 5 a.m. because I know that I'll be asleep at 5 a.m. or something like that, right? Um yeah, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking about like on Windows 10, they let me do that. They let me set like, when are my active hours? When am I most likely to not be using this computer? Let it do the up, the restarts and the updates at that time. And then uh, a couple of little behind the scenes things. So Project Mainline is now underway. This is uh, one of those big initiatives that, that Google has put together um, to help them like address the problem of the Android ecosystem fragmentation. Oh, this ever-present problem. Um, so more and more parts of like the core Android operating system, they're being... Um, kind of pulled out of that of that core and they're being distributed via the Play Store now um, so that Google can update them without device manufacturers like Samsung having to like ship new versions of Android, which is always, always, always the, the hardest part is just like getting all these other companies that don't really have a financial incentive to push updates to their phones um, to do so. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, talk specifically about like which modules have been changed in this version of Android, which ones are now distributed for, through the Play Store. But just know that like that's a thing. 
you'll be able to get more feature updates without actually having to do a, a Android system update. So good, good stuff is happening. Uh, the the other the other thing. This is man. This is really getting down into the weeds here. Actually, um, the identity credential API um, supports digital identification badges, which is defined in ISO eighteen o thirteen dash five. But you probably won't be encountering any like governments that are issuing digital IDs uh, to be used in this API or anything like that anytime soon. Um, but it, you know, Google is kind of laying the groundwork. They're they're putting this feature into Android so that in a theoretical future where uh, you know, okay, I, I bet you it's I'm I'm gonna call it right now. It's gonna be like Estonia or Lithuania or one of those like small countries that has like a big. Uh, tech sector, um, maybe which, whichever one does like um, electronic voting for their national national politics already. Like that'll probably be the first country that starts um, giving their citizens the option of like having government issued IDs that are tied to their smartphones instead of like tied to a physical card. Um, but yeah, so this API uh, supports that kind of thing. All right, that's it for Android 11. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. Uh, this episode of Second Opinion is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use uh, any or all of it as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page that this appeared on, which, uh, once again, is the nexus.tv slash so... 106. Uh, if you have any thoughts or questions about Android 11, you want to discuss it with other listeners, you can do so on our subreddit at reddit.com slash the Nexus TV. And if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make technology focused podcasts, uh, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Until next time. Have a good one. Hey everyone, Ian here from The Extra Dimension. We've got something a little special for you today. We here at The Nexus are promoting a charity for the annual Project for Awesome. So what the heck is the Project for Awesome? Uh, the Project for Awesome is a community-driven annual fundraiser for charities that was started in 2007 by Hank and John Green. They do a 48-hour live stream gathering donations from the community, and then the donations are split between charities that are chosen by the community. So, how does the community choose? Well, online creators, such as yours truly, promote a charity that they think is doing important work and encourage their audience to go and vote for that charity on the Project for Awesome website. And we here at the Nexus chose... The Electronic Frontier Foundation. Now, to explain what the Electronic Frontier Foundation does, I think there's no better place to look than just to read from their mission statement. When freedoms in the networked world come under attack, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is the first line of defense. EFF broke new ground when it was founded in 1990, well before the internet was on most people's radar, and continues to confront cutting-edge issues defending free speech, privacy, innovation, and consumer rights today. From the beginning, EFF has championed the public interest in every critical battle affecting digital rights. EFF fights for freedom primarily in the courts, bringing and defending lawsuits even when that means taking on the U.S. government or large corporations. By mobilizing more than 50,000 concerned citizens through our action center, EFF beats back bad legislation. In addition to advising policymakers, EFF educates the press and public. As we were discussing which charity we wanted to support, all of the Nexus hosts were on board with choosing the EFF. Brian Mitchell summarizes our thoughts here really well. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is one of the best examples that I can think of of an organization that continuously fights for the user. They center their goals around freedom of speech, privacy, creativity and innovation, transparency, international and security. 
They've helped create tools like HTTPS Everywhere and the Let's Encrypt CertBot, as well as taken issues to court against the federal government, the FCC, and the world's largest entertainment and electronics companies. The EFF website is quite extensive and is filled with guides, news, and other posts on all of the topics that they support. I think a digital rights foundation like the EFF is one of the most important groups that we can support to help every user of technology in today's digital world. Some recent highlights of the EFF's career. Uh, They turned 30 this last year in 2020. And also, of course, the year 2020 uh, brought a lot of challenges uh, to the online privacy and copyright protection space, uh, in addition to all of the other craziness that went on uh, last year. The EFF fought against government use of surveillance technologies uh, to track down protesters. They opposed the sharing of health data with law enforcement agencies. They cautioned against relying on app-based COVID tracking solutions as opposed to uh, live interview-based. And just before the pandemic started, they were part of a coalition that helped to save the .org top-level domain from falling into the hands of private equity interests. So, calls to action. What do I want you to do? Uh, The Project for Awesome live stream event happens this weekend, February 12th through 14th. Uh, That's noon February 12th to noon of February 14th Eastern Time. You can tune in there for uh, a lot of fun stuff. All donations to the Project for Awesome will be distributed to different charities that the community votes on. So also while you're there, uh, definitely go and vote for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And if you want to join the EFF directly, they, uh, they of course accept donations from individuals. All right, that's it for now. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.